Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. Now, this week's episode is going to be a bit different than the normal episodes we have for the podcast. Instead of one guest, we, we actually have four, and three have been on the podcast before. One even works for the podcast. But this episode is going to be dedicated to the incredible young Franco-American summit that took place in October. Um, all four attended the summit, and I'm hoping this leads to less of an interview, and more of a conversation about how it went. Now, the first guest is a huge part of Team French-Canadian Legacy. You're going to recognize her voice from our news segments, and you also know her from her incredible blog, Modern Franco's Melody Desjardins. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Thank you for having me. Now, our next guest uh, is a multiple-time guest of the podcast already. He also has a very exciting new book out, Tout nous serait possible, une histoire politique des franco américains 1874, uh, and he has a new position since we last spoke on the podcast. He's now the director of Acadian Archives at the University of Maine, Fort Kent. Patrick Lacroix, welcome back to the podcast. Great, thank you. I'm not sure if I should be pleased that you're back on U.S. soil. You, were, you seem to be having <laughs> such a great time in Quebec City. Hopefully this will make it a little bit easier to, to just hang out and, and chat. And I think I was a heck of a lot closer to where you are now when I was in Quebec City, actually. For sure, yeah. Although Mike and I have talked for quite some time about making a pilgrimage up to your area. So maybe now we even have a better excuse to do it sometime. But there you go. We can Perfect. talk about that later, perhaps when we get you on for the next full episode so you can hype your book. But welcome back. This is very cool. Now, the final return guest to the podcast with someone we had on earlier to discuss his amazing Dawson project, in which he tells the story of a fictional New England mill town, but using very, very real history, uh, and also using video game technology to build the city while telling the story. It is very awesome. Uh, he also has a new project, Dawson Revisited, where he interviews experts to further explore some of the topics that came up in the original Dawson narrative. And it's great to be able to welcome back to the show, Daniel Moreau. Daniel, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Jesse. I'm excited to be on here. This is cool. And the one new voice that will be new to the listeners of this podcast anyway, Timothy St. Pierre. Timothy's work has appeared in the forum. He has worked for the Quebec delegation in Boston. Somebody that I have been told, and it's definitely true, we need a full episode with on the podcast. So we have to work on that. But glad to have you as part of this discussion, Timothy. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Thank you so much. I am, I am excited to be here. I feel like I am meeting a celebrity for the first time. Truly, truly. I felt the same way the first time I met <laughs> Daniel, for sure. Absolutely. Daniel does that to people. Let's <laughs> start at the very beginning. Where did the idea for this come from? The idea to have a youth summit? I was talking to Lisa Michaud. She is the uh, community coordinator for the Franco-American programs here at UMaine about how we need to provide a space for young Franco-Americans to explore and negotiate their identity. And alongside that, after the last rassemblement, we felt that things were very established. We wanted to f have something kind of new. And so we just kind of came up with the idea of a uh, rassemblement for young people, which we ended up calling the Young Franco-American Summit. So eventually pushed all of us and we created the uh, Young Franco-American Summit subcommittee. And I somehow became the uh, de facto leader. And I think that's pretty much just because of my connection to Lisa. So you decided you had this idea, because uh, for those who might not have even heard the episodes of the Rassemblement. You compared it as kind of like a takeoff from the Rassemblement. Uh, maybe even step it back. What is the Rassemblement? What purpose does, why does the Rassemblement exist? Why we, what is that trying to achieve? And how were the goals perhaps similar or different from what that weekend is every year? 
So the Rassemblement is a an entire weekend. It's a Friday evening. It's an entire Saturday and a morning of a Sunday about Franco-American artists from all around sharing stuff that they've done. I guess really the only similarity between the two is that it's Franco-American sharing stuff they've done and also it's hosted by the Franco-American programs. And really the similarities end there. But what we wanted to do with that was make it shorter, make it less formal. That's that's the big thing is make it less formal. And also to kind of implement some some fun, some more fun in there and give it some energy. Gotcha. Okay, so was there talk? I mean, maybe we can get... Because I'm assuming all four of you were kind of involved in the planning stages before this ever happened. Um, so maybe somebody can let me know. Was there ever any kind of discussion about whether or not this would be an online situation? Because I know the past couple of years, the Rassemblement has just been virtual, uh, whereas you guys had very much had an in-person event. Was there even consideration of making this adjust online? Well, I, I think there probably was, but uh, maybe I'm a bit too much of an optimist and I already kind of saw it as an in-person thing. Um, to be fair, I think we did talk about it a little bit in the very beginning, but once we saw that UMaine was having in-person classes and it was like a, a r actual in-person year finally, that's when we said, hey, this, I think it would be great if we did it in person, not only because of that fact, but also because it being the first ever pilot event, it's going to help a lot. And plus, it's it's a lot easier for people to connect in person than it is virtually. But on the other hand, we also recognize that not everyone can attend that. I guess that's another difference between the Rassemblement and the Young Franco-American Summit is that the Rassemblement is very personal, where the Young Franco-American Summit is something that we want as many young Franco-Americans who we ended up being determined 18 to 35 year olds uh, to come together as, as many as we could and share our experiences and just network with each other. So what, da so what Daniel was saying about the Rizomoma, last year's was actually my first one ever. And although I enjoyed some of it, I did notice that a lot of us in our 20s we're getting lost and we just had this kind of glazed over look the whole time because we couldn't relate to what was being said. And that's no disrespect towards anybody at all. It's just when you have the younger generation and the much older generation, there's going to be so many differences. And even though we come from the same Franco-American background, there's still so many uh, different experiences that we have. And us in our 20s, most likely we didn't grow up speaking French. Uh, we know very little of it. So that was another thing that was kind of lost there. I wanna say that the older generation, they're a bit more about speaking French and that's understandable, um, but there's just not too much understanding about us millennial Gen Zs who don't speak French. We just didn't have that opportunity. And even my mom's generation, she knows more French than me, but even she didn't get that chance to become fluent in it because those opportunities were slipping from her generation. Having the younger one was just very refreshing for us being younger and we could relate to a lot of experiences of growing up, even though we didn't grow up speaking French. No, that's cool. I'm wondering, maybe you guys had a different experience than I did. I remember my first Rassemblement, uh, when I showed up with Mike, I was intimidated beyond belief because I was now we're in this room and I'm talking to people that I've looked up to for my entire life. We've been working on these, this cause for basically as long as I've been alive, but I'm definitely older than twenties. I mean, I was just, I remember we were sitting through and people are presenting um, their books that like that they've finished. It's like their, I don't know, fifth, sixth book or whatever. They're, upcoming research, maybe the latest play they wrote. I mean, these are super awesome, super interesting, super impressive people. And I just remember looking at Mike and be like, 
yeah, so we got to go up there in five minutes to talk about a silly podcast we started 10 seconds ago. Like, how is this possibly going to work as part of this larger thing? And for me, that was a kind of an intimidating situation for me. Um, so I can imagine maybe if everybody was kind of coming from a more similar place, I think that, that might have been useful, at least for my for me, if I was going to present something like that. I think that's kind of cool. You guys have an opportunity. Yeah, my first ressemblement, I, I was told about it by my then professor, Susan Panette, who is the director of the Franco-American programs. And I was just this fresh-faced freshman experiencing the Franco-American programs for the first time. And um, I went to the ressemblement. I, I didn't know what I was really expecting, but when I, when I w went there, I was so kind of awestruck by all of the talent the Rassemblement is something that I look up to, and I, I I have since I've I first went there, and I and I'll continue doing it ever since. It's incredible to see uh, who who attends and what they've done, and, and and I'm with you with that. When I first presented, I was like, "Hey, I I put two words together." I was like, "Oh God, these people have done books. They've." done plays, they're acting, they're, they've spent their entire lives just creating these immaculate pieces of art. And what, what have I done? I think maybe not only just being awestruck by the, the talent and everything, it, it also, in a way, makes me feel a little inferior, in a way. So that, that's pretty much my thoughts. I'd, I'd like to hear Timothy and Patrick's views on that. I mean, I will quickly jump in to say that as a very grateful audience member in Orono last month um, for the Young Franco-American Summit, I was struck by the talent in that room. So yeah, the Rassemblement is, is great. And there's like the regular players, a lot of like amazing people, both by virtue of what they create, but also like amazing people individually in terms of personalities. But that's also what I noticed, um, again, just listening to everyone and learning about these incredible projects that were presented in Orono. So I don't think that there is any disparity in talent. Um, I just think that we just have to encourage it and foster it and make sure that everyone recognizes how amazing the people in that room were and are still um, and all the great projects. And luckily, thanks to social media, I think that's kind of democratizing the whole process. It's easier to get young voices out there. Um, and that's an advantage that prior generations did not have where all this was top down, organized by, organized by the older generation that was well settled. Um, and it was a lot more difficult to create alternative institutions or to break through. So it's so rewarding now to see social media attention and just wider recognition of modern Francos and pieces that are published in the forum and Dawson and Dawson Revisited. So all these projects are getting that attention. And it was good to get, I mean, I was just thrilled to be in the same room as all these amazing creators. So the fact that the word is spreading and people are still getting to, to recognize that is amazing. Um, so very grateful. And I think that the older generation, by which I mean, me and you, Jesse, we need to watch out because they're, they're coming for us. Yeah, I, do, I will say, because Daniel's talking about, I met that fresh face freshman at the Rassemblement when, I, when we went the first time. And I'm being completely honest, as soon as Daniel was done presenting, Mike looked right at me. He's like, we got to stay in touch with this kid. He's onto something. Like, That's very, very cool. True story. Timothy, what was your experience like there, sir? I, I don't know if I'll be adding anything new that hasn't been said, but just kind of complete agreement that it was, it was really nice to hear everyone's work to, you know, have all the, these topics that are fresh and that are being re-examined and are, you know, it being discussed sort of outside of the shadow of, of work that's been more established and that has already sort of taken place. Because I, I think that is also something that, that can tend to happen either at the Rassemblement or just in, in not even necessarily in academia, but just in, in creative work and intellectual work, quote unquote. Oftentimes, there's so much that's just sort of taken for granted in scholarship or taken for granted in work that's already been done or that people think has already been done, things that people think are, are closed subjects, even, even if they were, you know, closed subjects 
20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, you know, lots of things are constantly changing. Um, you know, a lot can happen a year, a lot can happen in a decade, a lot can happen, you know, since like the 70s when when the, the Franco-American program, the Franco-American Center at UMaine was first founded. Um, sure. and, you know, the issues that we're dealing with now are not the same as they were then. And when people, you know, during that era were grappling with these issues of identity and language and, you know, their their own place vis-a-vis -vis sort of the quote-unquote older generation and you know the more established generation during their own time during their own you know 20s and 30s we're still dealing with those those same sort of questions you know um, of course what is our relationship to previous generations what is our relationship to our parents and grandparents what is our relationship to these these questions that they answered in their own right that we also have to re-examine for ourselves um and, you know sometimes it, it may you know seem like it's just overly introspective or you know quote-unquote navel gazing um, but, you know, to, to constantly make Franco-America and Franco-American identity something that is able to adapt to changing times and changing ideas is, these are questions that we constantly have to keep asking ourselves and asking each other. Um, and it's worth re-examining that in a space that isn't necessarily tied down to certain answers that people have decided are the correct answers for a certain point in time. No, that's awesome. Now, what, because we've, obviously we've talked to these other guests before, um, what have you presented on? Like, what was your topic that you chose to present? I, I just graduated this this past June, um, and for my French major, I wrote um, a thesis that was um, called "Ne pour un si fin, une analyse de classe des Franco-Américains dans le Maine." Um, so, a class analysis of Franco-Americans in Maine, um, and "Ne pour un petit fin," uh, you know, this this long-standing French-Canadian Franco-American expression translating literally to um, born for a little bun, born for a little piece of bread, um, but which is which is talking about either explicitly or not, it's talking about intergenerational poverty in this among Franco-Americans and French Canadians, this expectation that is just sort of our circumstances in life, that we're not going to have much, that we're not necessarily going to amount to much, and we shouldn't expect more than that, we should anticipate or try to receive more than that. And so I was, I, I was just looking at, you know, um, the socioeconomic identity and sort of barriers that Franco-Americans, specifically in Maine, but also to a, to a lesser extent, are, I mean, throughout all of New England that I was focusing on Maine, um, sort of this, this history of poverty and working class status that has followed us, you know, from Canada, from Quebec, through the, the Grand de Seigneur, to immigration throughout New England, how these, these same sort of ethnic delineations between the people who owned all the mills, between the people who owned all the factories, the people who were paying those salaries, who, you know, were, were growing rich and rich and rich from this oftentimes super undercompensated um, and exploited um, group of workers that were overwhelmingly Franco-American, French-Canadian in the mills, in the factories, led to intergenerational poverty and just uh, low expectations for what we should or could receive in life, sort of becoming intertwined in this image of, of who Franco Americans are in Maine and in New England. That is, is very, very cool. That's going to have to be a full episode for sure. I think we could do this for quite some time. Left me a lot there that I wish we could get into more right now, but we will later on. But can somebody give me kind of a maybe a recap of some of the other people who presented? So we also had Julia Rhinelander and Anna Faraty. Uh, who presented Very their cool. podcast, uh, Franco-American Pathways, which is an excellent uh, podcast, and I'm not just saying that because Lewiston. Um, <laughs> and they basically show kind of stuff in the Franco-American archives at USM in the Lewiston Auburn College. And it's it's a fanta absolutely fantastic podcast. So we also had Camden Martin, who is a French teacher at St. Dominic High School, and he presented uh, the Paris schools of Maine and also how students currently at St. Dominic Academy, kind of teaching them the, the history of th this, not only the school, but also the school system that they're a part of. And we also had Claire Marie Bresson, who is a professor at Harvard University. And she, she gave uh, the last presentation of the day about uh, invisibility in Franco-American society and how kind of that affects our being. And I, I think something that was so special with, about her 
presentation was that she used a little bit of everything from the past presentations and it it felt like it was a conclusion on purpose. Uh, she's just such a gifted presenter. We also had a keynote presentation by the Speaker of the main House of Representatives, the Honorable Ryan Fecteau. He, he gave a, a, a really great presentation about his experiences as kind of being a Franco-American, but not knowing that Franco-American is actually kind of a real thing. And I think that's something all of us young Franco-Americans are really, uh, really struggle with is that, you know, we're kind of told that our Mame and Pepe speak French and um, maybe we hear that we're French in your family, but we don't really know what it means. And um, I think that's something that we, we continue to struggle with. And I think that's the, the biggest thing that we as a culture need to work on is kind of making ourselves known as a thing that we exist. Because this is like the first time you guys have done this. Sounds like a very successful event. Obviously the hope, I guess, is that to have it every year. Is that is that what we're thinking? Is it gonna be like an, an annual thing? Is, the, is it gonna be the goal? Yeah, I think we're shooting for annual, but there's also been discussions about doing twice a year with one uh, in the fall as an, an in-person thing and then one sort of in the spring as, as a virtual thing that way there's a bit of a mix. I think it was a bit discussed uh, that that would replace the hybrid format that we uh, used as the for the pilot event. I mean, it, it's early on, and I think that there's still plenty of room for discussion and plenty of room for improvement. In the beginning of the planning process, we we were originally pl planning on having it being a, a two day event, but we were kind of unsure. We weren't sure if we would be willing to do really a, a whole two days. I think we felt that a, a single day event would be more appropriate. If the world was perfect, I think a multi-day event would be great, but I, I really think there's only room for one day. And I also think that there's that gives more um, more chance for new presenters in the future. My suggestion, I think it would be cool if you guys even stayed to one day is awesome but make it a one day with uh, kind of not necessarily expectation, but put the hint out there that maybe it would be cool if everybody presenting stayed at the same hotel together. So I think that, would, I think, again, I think that social piece after the events and the morning before is super, super important. I think that'd be way fun. Even with the, the one day format, there, there was still a lot of opportunity to, to sit and chat with other people. And it was just a very nice energy just because everyone was there with the same sort of enthusiasm. Everyone was there for the same purpose. It was because people feel passionately about it and they're interested and they're doing a lot of wonderful work um, relating to the subject. And it's, I found it really refreshing, if only because it allowed us all to have conversations about topics that are all, one, deeply important to us, but two, they were subjects that oftentimes the vast majority of other people don't know anything about besides like a very cursory understanding that there are people in Quebec who speak French and maybe there are a couple of people in the U.S. who do too. Um, which, which at least like in college, that was one of my biggest frustrations was wanting to talk about this and talk about scholarship around this. And each time I did, it felt like I would have to explain like 500 years worth of history in the course of like 35 seconds before someone lost interest. Sure. Um, or just decided it didn't really matter because it was something that seemed foreign and not really well known to them. And so being able to just have conversations at the depth where you didn't have to sort of rush through the, all that expository information was 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 really wonderful and, and refreshing, again, to, to reuse that word, but it really was. No, that's awesome. Growing up, uh, my Franco side of the family, it was always a very positive thing to be Franco-American, but uh, like a lot of people would describe, it was described as something that was in the past and there's really not much to it today. Um, but walking in there um, and listening to everybody just chatting beforehand and in between when we would have breaks, there definitely is a distinct culture here. And it was just really interesting walking into a room of Franco-Americans with high energy 
I have never experienced that before. Every time my Franco side of the family has gotten together, everybody is so quiet. We all take turns talking and nobody interrupts each other at all. And maybe that's just my family, but walking in there and like listening to everybody talking and just the applause and the cheers after each person had presented. Um, it was just very uh, nice to see. It was inspiring too, because I was sitting there and I'm like uh, thinking, uh, everybody is so high energy right now. And I thought I was a little, uh, taken aback by it a little bit because I've never experienced that before. I've never experienced energetic Franco-Americans. So it was amazing um, to have that experience and be right in the middle of it. So I can't wait for next year. I can't wait for the next 30 years, however long I'm allowed there. So I'm, I'm really excited for it. I just wanted, so this is going to sound like a non sequitur, and it is. So I just wanted to acknowledge the, the very real um, financial, but also moral support that we got from the Franco-American Center and Franco-American programs at Humane and Orono, um, from Lisa, especially from Susan Panette, um, and of course, Daniel being our man on the ground who spearheaded the, the whole planning process. Um, so huge thanks to them. Um, needless to say, organizing that and organizing the Rassemblement as well. Like that's a huge endeavor and that's a huge contribution that the center does to Franco-American life, not counting the, you know, the Franco-American programs and the students they have doing a minor, for instance. I think, Daniel, that's what you're doing. Um, and so, you know, all of this wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, and it would be great to be able to take the show on the road. But at the same time, I have mixed feelings because it's such a, a neat environment um, and something that's near and dear to a lot of Franco-Americans, that specific location. So who knows what the future holds. It would be great to, again, try to elicit more interest in Burlington and maybe Nashua, maybe Derry, New Hampshire, maybe Woonsocket, maybe some other place. So who knows what the future holds, but I just wanted to acknowledge how much they've done for us and how much they did, they did for the event. Yeah, and this, this sounds amazing. First of all, I, I've, I saw the picture of who was in attendance. I'm pretty sure I've spoken to everybody there, but the fact that you guys got to all see each other in person, I've seen very, very few of the people in that picture in person. So I thought that was really, really neat. Where do we, I guess my question, where do we go from here? You know, I, I think there are, are so many ways this could go, but I think the, the only way really is up. And I think there's, there's only room for growth. I, I think that getting more people involved, more young Franco-Americans like us involved, would not only grow the summit, but also grow the culture, grow our network. And I think we could also look at getting sponsorships from different places. Patrick's idea of getting it on the road and doing it in a few places would be great. Even though, you know, the, the Franco-American programs is so near and dear to our hearts that it's, it's, it's difficult to go to another place for a little, a little bit. But in terms of getting more people involved, I, I, I think that's the big question. Not only with the summit, but with Franco-American culture as well. Wait, I guess my next question then, are these recorded presentations? Were they recorded? Yes, they're, they're recorded and, um... I uploaded um, the keynote and all six presentations on my my YouTube channel. So the, the they are recorded. You recorded everything. You've uploaded them. And what we can do then uh, is perhaps post the links in the show description for this episode. So anybody can just click on that right below the episode. You can be good to go from there. Absolutely. And that the link to that playlist will give you the keynote presentation by Ryan Fecto and all six presentations by yours truly, Melody, Timothy St. Pierre, Claire Marie Bresson, Camden Martin, and Julia Rhinelander and Anna Faherty. Now, this is awesome. I really appreciate your time, guys. This is just an incredibly important event. I mean, something that I think people have talked about for a while. And so the fact that you guys were able to come together and pull it off and establish something that can go forward because having this type of summit is just incredibly important. We hear that I've been battling the narrative forever, you know, that 
Uh, the Francos are all really old and dying. So this is just an opportunity for us to show we're very much still here, very much have tons of energy. We're still producing new content all the time. Um, people are still very dedicated to the same things that they've been dedicated to you know, forever, just perhaps in a different way. So, very, very cool. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it all the time. Again, we've been joined by Patrick Lacroix, Melody Desjardins, Timothy St. Pierre, Daniel Moreau. Thank you so much, guys. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at FCL Podcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.